All right, folks, thanks uh, for coming out tonight. And um, this is, you know, the warmest room in the building. And no, it's not actually. But um, uh, thanks for coming out in one of our series of our uh, learning labs. Um, uh, this evening's presenter is uh, Matthew Nod. He's on uh, the conference staff uh, with uh, dealing with uh, young, mission of young people and uh, professions of faith. But tonight we're really going to talk about young people, the importance of um, including young people in our ministry, of reaching out, ministering to, to that demographic, and why really it makes a difference for us as we're in the process of revisioning and revisiting where God is calling us as a church uh, as well. So we're really blessed to have uh, Matthew here with us. He'll tell you a little bit more about himself and what he does. Uh, but let's open with a, uh, a word of prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God, Lord, we thank you for uh, this evening, Lord, that you provided for us this place, uh, a, a sanctuary, Lord, from the cold outside, a sanctuary from the coldness of the world sometimes. And you've given us, Lord, uh, this opportunity to gather, to hear about uh, your call upon us as, as we minister to your children, especially to young people and youth, Lord, and how important they are, Lord, uh, in your eyes, and, and how important they are, Lord, to be part of our church, because they are indeed a part of our church family. And so um, I just ask for your blessing upon Matthew tonight as he comes to present, that you would anoint him, Lord, and have him speak the words uh, you would have us hear, so that it would, uh, so that what we learn this evening and, and learn as we go forth would help to guide us in the process that uh, you're bringing us through at this time as we re-envision um, who you're calling us to minister to in our communities now. And so, Lord, uh, we give you thanks and praise for this opportunity. And, uh, and we give all of the glory to God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay. Well, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good to see you all, and thank you for coming out. Um, what day is today? Tuesday. Tuesday. Thank you. I was about to say Monday. That's how off I am. Um, it's really good to be here uh, today and just for being invited um, for these learning labs. I think it's a uh, really a privilege and honor, especially uh, because I've actually known about Grace City. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I am born and bred in New Jersey, um, grew up in Closter, attended Northern Valley Demarest, graduated uh, from there, went to UVA. It's the only time I was away from Jersey, so did my undergrad at the University of Virginia, and then ended up going back, um, and then went to seminary at Princeton, back in Jersey, and then served at, uh, my father was the lead pastor at KCC uh, MJ, which is the, uh, uh, wasn't the Indian, now then in Englewood, um, and that's where I grew up. And then I was, when I was in seminary, when did my ministry at Arcola, uh, KMC, where I was the, uh, was an associate for the past 11 years. And then I was appointed to this, position in the conference and don't know what I'm doing anymore. <laughs> so, That's not to hear. <laughs> so Scott was saying he'll tell you a little bit more about what he's doing. I was like, okay, we'll see. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. This is really my first year in this position. I miss the local church badly because um, I really believe in the local church. And I spent over a decade at a pole right near Prentice. My wife and I, uh, we lived in Ridgewood. We just recently moved a month ago. Um, to Upper Saddle River, but we were in Richmond for the past nine years. And uh, we have three boys, uh, twin five-year-olds, and a new one who will turn one in two weeks. God bless you. <laughs> Thank you. I need the blessings. Uh, um, so um, this is really a, a great opportunity, uh, if not for you, for me. Uh, when I heard Learning Labs, if anything, uh, it's a lot of an opportunity for me to learn. What got you to this place, and then where God may want to be taking us further. So this is as much a learning piece for you as I trust me, even more so for me. Um, just want to say a little bit more about myself, so you can have a context as to why maybe I'm in the position I am at the conference, and why I can uh, share what little I can here for you all um, today, and not waste your time. When I was at Arcola. I started out as a youth pastor there, and by youth, I mean junior and senior high. We probably had about 40 or so kids at the time. 
um, and I was a part-time staff person at the church. There was nothing by way of college, I felt there was nothing. Um, and I was doing seminary at that time. Um, as we did ministry, eventually the youth group graduated, they went into college, and the college students started coming to the youth services. I said, ah, this is kind of irrelevant for the college students, so I asked our senior pastor, uh, Timothy Ann, would it be okay if I started a second service for these college students, maybe about 15 of them or so. He said, you can do whatever you want, can't pay you, but you can do whatever you want. <laughs> I said, all right, I'll just do another service. So that began this kind of second service. You had this youth group service going on and the beginnings of this college ministry. Over time, in a year or two, this college ministry started to gain some traction. Um, that became 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 kids. And now these both were kind of going simultaneously. Around that time, I was starting to get ready to graduate uh, from seminary. And while this is going on now, we not only have college students, but kids that are graduating from college. Now you're looking at your early 20s, now mid 20s. And now, for those folks, the college service wasn't really entirely all that relevant either. Um, so we started to see this building up, and I was going to get married, and I said to our senior pastor, I said, you know what, I'm about to graduate from seminary, um, and I'm about to get married. I really think I need a full-time position. And if this church isn't prepared to give me a full-time position, I love this church, but I really need to uh, get a full-time seminary. <coughs> so unfortunately, if it can't be here, then I'm going to start looking elsewhere. Um, I wasn't ordained yet. I was still in the process, so I could just be a higher wherever, right? So, um, he said, no, don't go. We'll get you there. Not yet. Just, we promise we'll get you there, but just please stick around. In the meantime, why don't we do this? Why don't we just make you half time, okay? Just for the college young adults. And then we'll hire a part time for just the youth. So what we want you to really focus on these folks. So, okay. So that's what happened. I moved to just the college young adults. This group grew um, from about 40, 50, 60, and then it grew to about 110 or so. And during this time, um, in the adults' uh, service, this is again a Korean church, right? In the adult service, there was an English, they call them 1.5ers, which is they grew up in Korea when they were till about 12, and then they came to the States. So even though they could speak Korean, they prefer English, they've been in America 30 years probably, so they're much more comfortable with English, the 1.5ers. So there was about 20 of them gathering, and they asked the senior pastor, uh, can we have a pastor for us? Because we don't really understand all the Korean, and, you know. And he said, we can't afford it. Why don't you just join Matthew's group? Um, there was some resistance because I, as, um, as young as I look, uh, they thought I was even younger. And they said, you know, he's, he, did, he just got married. Um, I don't know if he would be able to understand our context. But kudos to them. In their mid-40s, they were willing to bet on, at the time, a early 30-year-old um, to be uh, the pastor there. So this, this group of 20 came in. And then we were what we called our Cola Covenant community, about 150 or so at that time. And then in the course of about two to three years, that ministry grew very quickly. Um, I think at our peak, we were about three, over 300 in, uh, on Sunday worship, uh, attendance in, in worship. And these are now just college 20s um, through mid-30s was the group. It was maybe mid three services. Um, and this is over here in Paramus. Um, at that time, it then became a bit more multicultural, but probably still kind of Asian American. Um, and then I was at that time then um, moved into this position. So then I think their expectation was that I would have something to speak to about youth, young adults, and how to do this here at the conference. And um, I say, well, there's so many a lot of things I've learned, but um, I think I had a really good people, and I had a lot of grace. Um, um, and so that's kind of what led me to this place. This past year, I've had the blessed opportunity to visit lots of churches, a lot of contexts, small, large, growing, shrinking, um, everywhere in between, right? And so I've learned a lot more about the differences that are um, in each of the churches and what makes them so contextually beautiful and challenging. Um, the one thing I can share at least about this area is that I know 
this Burton County area fairly well because I've basically grown up in this space. Um, like Hoffman is right where I spent the past nine years in Ridgewood. Um, so I, I feel really comfortable with this general area. I'm still learning South Jersey. So when they call me down to Delaware Bay, I'm like, I don't understand what's going on here. Um, they call me to different places in Jersey. I, never, I, never, uh, I didn't you know, realize horses were in so many places of Jersey. Apparently <laughs> there are. And I thought that all malls were everywhere. Apparently they're only in Paramus. Um, uh, so little things I'm learning. Um, so that's uh, really the little bit that I can bring to the table. And what I wanted to do today was share some ideas with you um, and then probably give a lot more space for questions and responses. Because like I said, every church is very, very different. And so to take a broad brush and to say, well, this is what can work for here, I, I just won't work. Um, I just met with another church this past Sunday. And in as much as the general rules are the same, how to contextualize that congregation is very different. Same goes for two other churches from the last week. So um, we'll do the best we can. And if anything, pull what you can from what's shared, and hopefully we'll prime the pump for you in your ministry here. All right? You ready? Ready. Oh, okay. um, I know that um, I saw out on the lobby the flyer for the District Day of Learning, um, and I'll be presenting there as well. At, but for the District Day of Learning, I don't know that all of you will be there or not. So um, what I wanted to do was actually give some of the general points of what I was going to share. I am going to share at the District Day of Learning. So Scott, when you're there, don't come to mind somewhere. <laughs> um, otherwise, um, I just want to touch upon the main points for you all, okay? So what I call the workshop is the five gifts uh, young people ministry brings to your church. Um, five gifts a young people ministry brings to your church. By young people, I mean youth, young adults, um, and so forth. Um, so let me let me start off by a question, by asking a question. Um, why do you really want a young people ministry? Or I should I should let me take it. Do you want a young people ministry? Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Before I go into that, um, what I did at our forum was what we call English ministry. These are English speaking in an immigrant church, right? So this EMs. EMs, English Ministries, and KMs, Korean Ministries. Um, I, one of my mentors uh, led a seminar once on how to create an EM, an English Ministry. And it was attended by all these KM senior pastors. And so the first question he asked was, how many of you want an EM in your church? <laughs> they all raised their hand. And he said, mm, you didn't hear what I asked you. He said, how many of you want an EM? Still, they weren't getting it, so they all kind of raised their hand. They said, You're not hearing me. I'm going to say, He said to me 10 times, Do you really want any of your church? And the more he emphasized, Do you really? And then he said, The reason why I asked that is this if you really want an EM, then you can get an EM. And you can nurture that EM to grow. But I promise you, they will grow like your children, right? And then they will start to do their own thing. They will have their own visions. They will take up your parking spaces. They will cost a lot of money, and they will break things in your building. <laughs> they will rearrange the needs of the, of the church. They may redecorate every room in this place. And, he said, and, they may, and as they earn money, you may find power struggles. Now, do you really want to hear? And you saw a lot of the, the senior pastor. Mm -hmm. I really wanted that. that. <laughs> what they wanted was they wanted an EM that they can kind of control, right? Mm -hmm. That made them feel good, brought in some, some funds for them, so they, and, and, and was good for the reputation, but still one that they could ultimately control. And he says, if that's the case, you won't get one. So to the people that are really ready for it, he said, okay, now we can talk. So with the same kind of vein, I ask you, do you really want a young people in the street? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yes. 
I wasn't as enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Great. Fantastic. Um, so here's the question I ask: Is why then do you really want a young people ministry? Because they're missing. Okay. Because they're missing. It's the future of our church. The future. 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 Okay. I'll give you credit for this. You guys are giving me actually better answers than some of the other churches, mm -hmm. because the other churches gave me this. Because we are one. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but they say we need a young people ministry because we're dying, we're getting old, and if we don't have young people in, then this church will die. And no, regardless of how true that may be, I say, so basically, what you're telling me is you want youth so that you can stay alive. Mm, come on. Is that yeah, right? They bring life. Right. But for the, for the sake of the church, meaning, are the church simply a vehicle, a, a ventilator? Right? That's kind of a different ventilator, just like, okay! Oh, and then someone on a ventilator, are, even though they're alive, are they living? The youth are just as important to the church as the people who have been here 50 years. Bingo. I love what you said. I wonder if the entire church may agree. The people that are in this room, probably. Okay. Yeah. People that are here, right. Right. maybe not. Maybe. Right. And for those, and, and, and that's going to be really important because if you're the leaders here, you're finding ways to communicate that message, right? Because if that's why the church at large wants young people ministry, just so they can say, like, I promise you, you will not get it, right? If that's the reason, no young person, no young whether you, anyone else, wants to come to a place that simply they're going to be used uh, for ventilator sake. There's no vision, there's no purpose there. So who, why does the church really need young people? I'll start by saying this. 2,000 years ago, Jesus called a bunch of teenagers. The 12 were not these PhD students. They were not religious scholars. They were not people who were in the field for, and had 50 years of experience. These were not these people. Um, the studies would uh, show that they were probably in their late teens. One was married. Possibly more. Meaning, Jesus called a bunch of young people, young people, together, and used them to literally spread the gospel that changed the culture, that changed the world, that changed our lives. Right? And he started with a group of young people. No budgets. People. It's been the youth that have actually called us to push that envelope to keep us from being stagnant stale in what it is we're doing and what we're actually about. In our culture, we're seeing change at speeds and at levels that we've not seen for a very, very long time. Um, so not just with color or shape or music, but deep structural change in how we see ourselves as people. And more than ever, the church at large, and I'll say even this church, desperately needs young people. So here are the five reasons why young people are really necessary. And it's not just to keep us alive. That's not one of them. The person says, young people ministry is vital to helping teens integrate into the larger intergenerational community of the church. Meaning, I, I have a lot of churches, um, and forgive me if you are one of them, okay? So if, by, by saying forgive me, I'm not looking at you in case I offend. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I have lots of churches that I've asked, I say, they say, oh, I wonder why our young people aren't coming to our church. I wonder why our young people are coming to our church. And I say, what are you guys, what are you guys doing to help? How are they participating? And like, the church, oh, we give them so many opportunities to participate. They're like, they're acolytes. Uh, we're their greeters. Uh, they, they'll, they'll, they'll pass the offering basket. I say, mm -hmm. uh, sounds riveting. Sorry. <laughs> no, I don't know how many kids are waking up. Uh, it's a, I mean, I'm not taking anything from being an accolade or being that, but I'm, I'm wondering how many of us are dying. Um, um, and again, not taking away from the, the, the holy privilege of, of these kinds of positions, but how many young people who are, are burning inside to be the accolade and to say that that's how they're participating in the life of the church? I'm saying that's what I've heard in a lot of the churches that I've visited. And I say, that's you have one tool to get them in the church? 
I'm surprised you got two to <laughs> hold those candlesticks. I'm surprised. That's an amazing commitment for those two. Because I would not be here. Um, meaning, to integrate, if we're just waiting for young people to come to the church, you'll be waiting a long time. I will not tell you the name of the church. One church I visited down in South Jersey, there, were two, there was a like this, a leadership gathering. Mm -hmm. One group of leaders, uh, the, the issue on the table was, can we hire a youth pastor, a young people ministry pastor? The issue was, we don't have the money. So, okay, understandable. But one group said, but well, we need to hire a young uh, a youth pastor or else to bring the youth in. The other group said, no, 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 no. Well, when they come, then we'll hire them because there's a need, right? So, oh! So then I, I, I said, okay, understanding the, the truth about both, which one do you think I think makes the most sense? Have the youth happen first. Okay. In other words, this, right, this group was, we're just going to wait for them to ask, why are they going to come? For what reason would they come? Again, to hold a candlestick? For what reason? Um, people ask, um, why are the youth leaving the church? Why are the youth leaving the church? My question back to them is, is, what is it that they're missing? What are they missing, really? Is it um, not much? So then why don't they come? You know, it's, 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 it's not rocket science. It's some level, right? Deep theology? So a youth ministry, young people's ministry, whether it's youth group, young adult ministry, is integral to helping teens integrate into the larger community of the church. You need some kind of a bridge that's going to help communicate, help decipher some of these things, and act as not only a bridge, but a uh, receiving place as well as kind of sending in and clearing out space. I, I have another example that you would like I could share later, um, that two churches had come to me and asked me about um, they had five churches in South Jersey that had 10 kids, 5 kids, 0 kids, 15 kids, 8 kids, and they wanted to know how they could get more kids. And I said, instead of just getting 10, 15, 8, I wonder if you five, because they're all in relative distance, can create even a new church. <clears throat> Don't tell the bishop I said that. But a young people church, if you will. Um, what would that look like? I'll say more about that. But again, this idea that you're helping them create a, a, a passageway for them to get in so that they can get in, right? Because if you don't have this, get in, I promise you, they're not going to come. There's no reason to come. Second, young people ministry resists the status quo, helping the church stay relevant in the changing culture. The culture is changing. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Things are changing. Amen. And I'll tell you this. Young people, teenagers may not have all the answers, right? Even though they think that they may, they may not have all the answers, but I promise you they have the right questions. They do. They bring the questions about what really matters about being Jesus in this world. And the church needs that voice. It needs, as uncomfortable as it may make the church, it needs to hear those questions and wrestle with those questions and not just shut those questions down. It needs to hear them. It needs to work on them, not silence them, so, so that the church can be relevant in a changing culture, because those questions are not going to be coming from, unfortunately, our, 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 our parents or our parents' generation, right? They're going to be coming. They're always going to be coming from underneath, from those that come. Why? Even my five-year-old. Uh, Dad, why do you close your eyes when you pray? I don't know. Okay, to help me concentrate. So can I just pray my, listen, just close your eyes, okay? My five-year-old. But I mean, just some, they're, they're asking, right? At five years old, they're asking questions. What would a 12-year-old be asking? A 16, an 18, a 28-year-old? These are really deep questions, issues around homosexuality, sex trafficking, justice, music. Right? Why do we do that? Why do we have this? Why can't that change? Why can't we change that? Why do we put so much money in this area? Kids will ask. Seems like a waste of money. Like, no, it's not. If you understood the whole budget, no, 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 no. It's an important question. <laughs> Why are we doing that? That's the second one. Young people ministries resist the status quo. They just do. 
and that helps the church stay relevant. Okay? The third is this. Um, Young People Ministries focuses on inviting those who are not already part of the church into a deeper narrative of God's plan for human kind. Yeah. Uh, they focus on inviting, in other words, people who are not part of the church, they help bring into the church. That's basically right. it. If you take a look at all the different ministries in your church here, as great as they may be, all the different research that's been done, you will find that youth ministry, young people ministry, young adult ministry, is instrumental in reaching those who don't know Jesus. Think about all the ministries, whether it's even outreach, missions. How many of your outreach and missions actually bring people into the church? Probably not so much. When you think about your hospitality, maybe your welcoming, maybe your refreshments, maybe uh, whatever it may be, your different ministries in your church. It's actually, studies have shown, research have shown, young people ministries that have actually proven to be the most effective in bringing new people in. And by new people, I don't just mean the children or the youth, I mean the youth and their families. Right. If you're doing it right. Mm -hmm. It reminds the church that you have to be a light. And youth ministry, young people ministry, seems to be the place where a lot of this energy comes from in a lot of faith communities, not just Methodists. They are in a position where they are still formative and exploratory as young people. They're still unsettled in their careers, right? They, or they haven't had any yet, or, or they're deeply desperate for relationship and community. And so when you get, I'll tell you what, when people ask me, how did we get from 150 to 300 in two years? I, I'll tell you, it was through the young people, young adults, and their friends. Because when they had three of those friends, they said, oh. And they, and they start, start talking about it. Then some of those, because their friends are all ultimately watching, comparing their life with their own life, and well, why am I not, why, hmm, what are you doing? And they like, we had a lot of an amazing time at this thing. Like, hmm, you should come, and we won't see them maybe the first month, but I promise you by the eighth month we'll see them. They'll give it a shot, they'll give it at least one week. And at that point it's then our responsibility when they do come, that's our job, to find ways to keep and capture, <coughs> uh, inspire, um, and make relevant for them, right? But I tell you, they're, the people, if it's good, they will share that with their friends and communities, and they bring them in. That's the third. The fourth, I'm going quickly, because I think I want to spend more time actually with you all on how Grace UMC um, can function this way. The fourth um, is this. Youth and young people ministry reminds the church that teens are not marginalized members of the body. But like the chair here, right? There we go. Co-creators, conspirators. Write those two words. Co-creators, conspirators in the divine work of the church. Think about this. There is no other place where young people have equal footing as an adult except what? The church. There's nowhere else. Politics, right? Education. Think anywhere else. There's nowhere else where young people and adults have equal footing because Christ is the equalizer. Right? They are an equal member of the body. They are not marginalized because of their age, because of their stage of life. They are part of the body. And so even Paul reminds that, right, of, us, of that, that all parts of the body are necessary and essential for its survival. How are we doing as leaders advocating for this in our church? that teenagers and young people aren't just doing their nice little thing on the side, but are literally co-conspirators in what's going to happen here at the church. I even have a little bit to say about, uh, uh, you can forgive me, the, you know, the Book of Discipline, mm -hmm. when it says, oh, and, 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 you know, whether it's one of the committees, make sure you have one of the youth or young adults. Oh, well, why, why not one? Why one? <coughs> it's kind of like, it's like a throwaway. Just make sure that they're kind of participating in that. Mm -hmm. um, but, I will tell you that there is nothing that grows a young person's sense of identity and worth and hunger than giving them some measure of not only their worth, value, and voice, but responsibility to the whole. Um, one real life example is, uh, so um, we, one of the first things that uh, was placed on my desk when I got into this position was this Ignite Conference. 
let's do that youth conference. Um, they said, there's this conference and you just gotta do it. Ah, I don't know what this is gonna be. Um, so one of the first things that we did was, um, I had no idea what this, annual, uh, this big night conference was going to be. The bishop said he needs to be big, he needs to be better, and he needs to be great. I said, oh man, <laughs> and we're stressed out right now. Um, and at annual conference, we had youth delegates from each of the districts, one youth and one young adult from each of the nine districts, so we had 18. I met with the youth and young adults delegates uh, each night at the annual conference over pizza and just kind of gathering. And one night, I sat them around in the circle. You know, they, they didn't know me. I was just maybe three months into the position. I didn't know them. Um, but one of the first things I said was, okay, guys, I need you. You don't know me, but I need you. And they're like, what, what, is, what is this little Asian guy talking about, right? I said, I, there's this Ignite conference coming, and it's supposed, it's gotta be big. What I wanna ask you is, I need your help to design this. So tell me, what's burdening your heart? What do you think there are things that really, you, people in your classes, in your schools, in your circles of life, in your friendships, what are some things that are really important to you? And we just had a talk. And then they talked about the fact that there's depression, there were uh, there's anxiety, there was certainly, uh, there's a lot of bullying, mm -hmm. suicide, attempted suicide. There's a lot of these kind of identity issues. And from that whole discussion, I was just taking notes, just letting them create. And then afterwards I said, hmm, I think I got it. I think this Ignite conference for 2014, I got it. It's going to be about identity. And um, so, um, and so we called it Rediscover You. It was one of the songs in Starfield, which was the main band, uh, Rediscover You. And I said, at the end of this, I would like the young people to at least have heard three things, that they have a vision for their life, that God has a vision for their life, that they have a voice that matters that can speak, and that they have a um, voice, what did I say? Vision. Vision and value, that they're worth. So the speakers that I hired, and not hired, what do you call it? Brought in. One of them was actually by the name Nelva Marquez Green. She couldn't come, I'll tell you why, but. Melba Marquez Green, her, uh, you remember the Sandy Hook shootings? Mm -hmm. A couple years back? She, her daughter was one of the young people who were killed, six year olds who were killed. Um, um, and yet she wrote a whole, that became viral, a whole letter saying that, um, 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 that the shooter was a young person, um, was not a monster, but was also a child as well. And she termed it love wins. And that love wins term became viral, right? Millions and millions of people. I got Melba to come because I wanted her to talk to the young people and saying, you guys have value. Mm -hmm. and, and I just lost my daughter in this most horrific shooting, right? Mm -hmm. uh, last week she said she didn't come because they were coming up on the anniversary of her daughter's shooting and the emotions were just too raw. But we did spend time that morning praying for her. I got Zach Hunter, who was a young person. He, was only, he, he, he gave a talk, he was only 23 years old. But he started when he was, he started a movement called Loose Change to Loosen Chains. It was an anti-slavery movement. He started at the age of 14. He wrote four books. He was only 23 now. He wrote four books, featured on CNN, everywhere. I got him to come, and I wanted the young people to see I have a voice. I'm 14, I'm 18. This guy's written four books already. Why can't I, right? So all the things, the songs, the music, the Everything that happened at the night conference was built around what happened that evening in, in that room. And then one of the kids, uh, he's at, from Bridgewater UMC, his name is Kevin Kaufman. Um, they were at the night conference, and I saw him walk by. He said, hey, man. I said, oh, Kevin, come here, come here. I was like, hey, good to see you. Hug. I put my arm around Kevin, and I said, look around. And there were about 700 of you right, at that time. And there's bands playing, star is playing, people like, ah. I said, I want you to look around. And I said, you did this. This is all happening because of what you shared that night. When I said that, his eyes kind of went big, right? I mean, he was just a junior in high school, no, junior going to senior high school, uh, going to be a senior. His eyes got so big, and the amount of what pride mm -hmm. he felt in that moment. And I said, if anything, I just put the, 
dots together with 18 from you guys. And that <coughs> sense of pride that he did this, that he brought back that to his food. How much did that uplift that young, young guy, right? And, and filling with, wow, I really can do amazing things in this world. All I did in that moment was remind him that he was a what? A co-creator and a conspirator. And, I, and if it was going to fail, that's fine. It was going to fail. But we're going to fail together. And then we'll come back up together. Because that's what the church is. <clears throat> Our cola, my last church, people always want to ask, how did it get from one to three hundred in two years? And I say, what people don't see is, the first six years I spent building, if you will, grand loyalty with 40 or 50 young people. We were going to fail together. And we failed. We made some really stupid decisions that did not work and some that really worked but wherever we failed we did it what yeah. Yeah. and i said listen this is absolutely <coughs> on me but it's on you too because we are doing this together and then the ownership and then, and then they wanted to do more and more and try more and it became something really really magnificent and that's how it grew so I cannot underestimate number four, that young people are co-creators and conspirators so long as they're kept as just acolytes, again, forgive me for just, you know, I'm not trying to minimize that, but as long as they're just kept as um, filigree in the church, um, then the church will die, and it's not uh, by virtue of age. Last one. The youth, young people ministry helps the church focus on the way of Jesus, which goes beyond tradition, dogma, and ritual. It helps the church focus on the way of Jesus, which goes beyond tradition, dogma, and ritual. Um, I'm not trying to knock tradition um, because I, I'm firm believer in it, but as institutions, age, and as they get older, they tend to get more formal in the way they operate. Remember the Pharisees and Jesus? And remember the woman that was caught in adultery? They both have a similar position on adultery, right? Jesus said, we can all say, be, right? We can all be clear on that. They both have the same position on it. They both despise it, yes. But the way they treated the adulterer was miles and miles apart. One held stones in their hand, right? For tradition. This is the way, this is law. One held stones in the hand, the other stooped down. Because the way of Jesus is often quite different from the dogma of Jesus. That's right. They may both believe the same thing, mm -hmm. but the way they did it. And there's something about young people that they, they get it. I'll tell you what, they, and you can't say, oh, it's because just young people, young people, they think. Pope Francis <coughs> is a rock star. They love Pope Francis. Love Francis. And is it because he's young? No. It's because they see he understands what? The way of Jesus. And he's not locked into tradition, dogma, and ritual. That doesn't mean that every so when they hear stories that uh, that Pope Francis strips down into street clothes and sits with the homeless uh, at night outside of his armored car. And that becomes the, that just becomes uh, viral, right? But does that mean that the Pope Francis then puts away all his all his garbs? No. Then he's back up when he needs me, right? With all this and on, and does his important work as well. But young people really understand the way they love to see that in the church, and that's what's really important because they help us remember that. Why do we do that? Why is that necessary? Is that really necessary? I remember one Sunday, I came in and I, I wore my robe and my stole, because normally I would just preach in a suit or just spend in, in a slacks and a shirt. But one Sunday I came in with my a robe and my stole, and the, the young was like, whoa, easy, they, oh, did someone die? Like, what are they? <laughs> Some people then, they, they called, they're like, why are you wearing a cape? You know, <laughs> um, uh, and it was important for me, you know, to, to share at that moment, I said, well, and so when I went up, went up there, because I'm not talking about getting rid of tradition, ritual, or dogma, but to frame it, right? So it was a teaching moment. So I said, no, 
I want, what I want you to see is that this robe represents an I represent a higher office than myself. So when you see me, you're not going to see me. You're seeing a higher office that I represent. So not the man, if you will, the office of God. Right? The stolen represents many things, but one is, is that we're yoked with Christ. And if you will, this is my yoke. In other words, in Jesus Christ, I'm tied to my Christ. So wherever he goes. These are just some things that these represent. And help them. Oh. They still call it cake. Some of them. <laughs> That's pretty cool. As long as you help to clarify why that would be important without just saying, because that's just the way we do it. Yeah, that makes sense. Why? Okay. Then I'm completely disconnected from why that's important to me. You know, I would hope that as we do ministry, and these really are the five things. Um, of course, there are many more, but at the very least, five things that the young people ministry really brings. So what I want us to hear is the gift that they can bring to really revitalize the church. They can challenge the church in, in ways that are quite uncomfortable, but life happens that way. And we're remembering that the gospel movement really began with Jesus and 12 days. Young people, why can't it begin again here in the new season that Grace University has? But whatever the first vision now, and to maybe envision some of the young people here, that would be exciting. Um, so I don't know how much time Scott I have um, here, but at the very least, I want to just kind of throw that out there and then maybe take some general questions. Um, yeah, we're not to get on the so. Oh, <laughs> Question answer times might be more and more helpful um, for this particular Okay. When you started talking about your ministry at Arcola, mm -hmm. you used the word service rather than fellowship or whatever it is. What we have here for our youth is youth fellowship. Mm -hmm. We don't have a service for that. Can you tell us more about how that started? I, again, and this is more of my learning too, because I grew up in a Korean church. Okay. But most all the Korean churches have separate services for their children. They have it for their youth. Um, everyone's in their own kind of space. Part of that necessity, because me, my Korean sounds like a train wreck. Um, uh, it's to me, father for the adults. Um, so a lot of our young people, they don't really speak. So they're not going to sit in adult service when they don't understand the lick of it. Um, so that's so like your culture. Is it's know. more of a, a Korean American type culture. Uh, but with these larger churches, not only in New Jersey, but certainly across, you'll find that to be the case. Now you'll find young people having, having their own service and owning that service and running it. That's a great idea. Right. Something that we haven't really tried. Right, right. So I, mean, I think when I did that, um, what happens when you have a youth group Doing that, then you obviously have the pastors running the show, so to say, and make sure things are kind of where they're supposed to be. But the staff, the, if you will, the council of even youth, they're all from that group. Once it grows, and this is the beautiful part about it, once that youth group grew into college and then young adults, our young adults became, over the next two or three years, we fed it back into the larger church. So all the teachers, child care providers on Sunday, for the whole church, not just the English ministry, but for the camp, everybody, were all from our young adult ministry. Um, they that they used that as a you know, as a kind of feeding system, um, and as, as a way to, and then they were just delighted because now they have young adults <laughs> who can obviously speak to the youth much more than older adults can. Um, and so this may be a, a, a shameless plug and say, you know, I think having youth pastors is very important. Um, there's a lot to that, but because um, one church will say, uh, I try to do it and they just don't come out. And I said, well, tell me about who leads this youth. Yeah, well, that's a retired, she's like 62 and 
She'll take them, she'll open up, you know, to take them out to the movies once a month. There's no reason why any young person would go with a 62 year old woman to the movies once a month unless 20 of her friends are doing that, okay? There's no reason why that's going to happen. Um, you, so there's a part of that is kind of needing to be relevant to their particular demographic and their particular age group. Um, um, and, and another thing is, I'm jumping around a little bit, but young people, they are extremely aware of um, uh, the, the, the mass movement. So one of the things I say is on Facebook, for example, I visit a lot of churches that say, we did an event, we put it on Facebook. So we did our part. We made it relevant to the young people because aren't the young people using Facebook? So we put it, we made an event, we put it on Facebook, we did our part. I said, like, oh. So I'll go to that event, I'll look it up. And then I'll see that it's, oh, come, pizza, pizza, and uh, ice cream, social, fellowship, hall. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did uh, I mention pizza? Hall on Sunday, 6 p.m. or something like that. And I'll look. And then it'll say, uh, like, how many likes? Maybe two likes. And one of them's the pastor, and one's the office manager. Or something like that. Right? <laughs> like, ah! I'll tell you that youth, young people, when they look at something like that, they're, the first thing they're looking at is what? Who's the boss? Who's the That's the first thing they're going to look at. So it, you can leverage that in such a way, right? Where I promise you, if you see two people and one's the pastor, it's got like, as cool as Scott is. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's that cool. Yeah, yeah. 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 This, this guy, these guys are pretty desperate uh, to get some people in there. Um, so, but if it's driven by the young people, so the more you can move that in there, so but they see something 30, 40, 50 likes them, oh, even if it's pizza and ice cream in the basement, 50 people are going, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know what kind of basement this is, but obviously it must be something pretty, pretty <laughs> awesome. Right? And then they'll start to, they'll check it out at least. And then again, it's on us, right? It's on you to make that pretty awesome pizza, ice cream in the basement an experience for them. And with it, maybe they've never seen before. Um, but yes, the youth, the youth service, I think, is a, is a really key component because it gives them ownership, it gives them a vision, it gives them a voice, it gives them a budget, and you let them come your dream. One of the churches that I went to, um, they had about 20 young youth leaders, so it's a larger church, but they were struggling. And so when I sat with them, I said, this is what we're going to do. And I brought out a board, and we had about 10 uh, youth, um, I don't know what you call them, uh, parents, leaders of the church there. And so I said, okay guys, um, just dream with me, will you? Say you have a million dollars. <coughs> what would you want your youth ministry to look like? And then one of them said, oh, we really want our own space. And I said, okay. So I wrote down a youth, their own space. Mm -hmm. And then one of them was like, mm, but uh, that room won't work because we're using that for the choir. And I was like, no, 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 adults can't talk right now, right? Let the youth what? Dream. Mm -hmm. yeah. like, oh, and you can see the kind of the, 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 the adults in the room who know the politics of the church, they know everything, like, mm, I don't want to do work. And let them dream. So they said, we want to, and then they said, we have, um, they go, because they had an old bus for the youth that was breaking down. They said, we want a new bus. And I said, oh, that's awesome, a new bus. So I put that in there, and then they said, it's very expensive. You know, who's really going to drive that? And they were like, going straight to the red tape. I was like, no, shh, shh, you can't talk. Let them dream. And then they put down about 25 things that would make their youth ministry, just something that they'd love to be a part of, and that they would feel comfortable with what? Bringing, bringing people to. I said, that's awesome. Now let's start whittling it down. And then over the next hour and a half, we whittled it down to three things. And one was the room, one was the bus, and one was a, uh, a particular mission trip. Uh, even though they did mission 12, it was gonna be a different kind of trip for, for that group. And then I said, that's, a great place to be in. Now, for the adults, you have to help them accomplish this. Help them brainstorm. If it's an issue of money, then do a capital campaign. Do, don't say no, right? 
let them vision and let them. And I said, if you're going to do that room, and because they even talked about the furniture they wanted, I said, I will buy one of the chairs that you wanted. It was like a six dollar chair. I said, I'll buy one of the chairs. They go, okay, we got one chair. I got a text message. They said they're starting. Where's the chair? So I gotta, I gotta pay up. I gotta pay up for this chair. But I find it. I say it's a good investment, right? Um, so yes, you need service gives them a lot of that ownership and, and pride, um, and that's a starting point. And it, it goes if you keep feeding that monster, if you will, mm -hmm. that baby, it becomes this adult that really starts to take care of you um, and the church that they love um, because it's theirs. It's not their parents any longer. And I think we've seen that. Last year, I got to tell you, on was it, um, was it Good Friday? When do we have our our our, our, our play? Good Friday. Good Friday. Friday. That ten of our service last year, I thought was absolutely mm -hmm. Our students, our confirmation students, they took ownership of that. That was a sight to behold. I mean, I hear people still talk about it and the pride they had in that. And then we have our confirmation class. We have them prepare an actual service that, you know, their service, and to brainstorm with them, and watch them do it. It, it, it is it is a lot of fun, and you can see when you empower them, a little light bulb goes off. Not everybody gels to it. Not everybody's going to gel to it, but you can see the wheels spinning. And I think it's it's you know I, I've seen it in action here in our church, and I think you know what you speak, I I, I hear you. Well, I I I you are you are speaking you are speaking to the choir. You're speaking to the choir. Can you can you say a, a few words about how you maintain continuity? Over the years, we've had large confirmation classes, mm -hmm. and then it seems to pretty much disappear. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how you would approach in, in, uh, helping those people continue in their, in their path? So say I was a new pastor here, right? There's a reason why confirmation, part of it is they have to come because it's, they have to, you know, right. and there's a structure to, and there's also an <laughs> end time. You know, it's like, what, it was eight weeks, 16 weeks, whatever. Um, um, so there's a fixed, uh, and uh, the, there's a goal, there's a mission, there's a purpose, right? There's an end point. And this is not just for confirmation, this is for church leadership in general, right? You always have kind of a goal and an end point as well, so that we can kind of vision and hope um, to the next, the next rising. If I was a youth pastor, say here, I would say, using those however many confirmation students, I would feed into them and build as much energy and enthusiasm and love, if you will, for one another. Right? So that's not just a confirmation that I'm coming to. I'm coming because I'm experiencing and feeling something like friendship, mm -hmm. something like fun, something like faith, right? You'll have time to do little more of those faith pieces as their life evolves and they're gonna come to you. And then from that, once that confirmation is over, I have something right after that ready to go because uh, that needs to jump right in and keep that momentum moving. I'll give you a. a a, a, a word that Preston Senswell, who was the keynote speaker at Ignite this past year, he does huge events. And he's a speaker at all these places. Uh, he does Creation Fest, which uh, is coming June in Pennsylvania, that's going to see 80,000 people. He's the speaker for that. He told me, he goes, Ignite, he goes, this is really great. This first year you guys did it, great. And he goes, keep that momentum going. This is what he said you only get one chance down the hill. You've got a lot of excitement. People are really excited about it because you have one chance now to help. Use it. So our planning, that's why we have the rally is coming up. That's why I think 2015 is going to probably be bigger. We're trying. He says, you have one chance to keep that going. I promise you that if you don't do anything or if you do something less, that momentum will stop. And then starting that up again is twice as hard as it was that first time. So part of it would be, how do I get this confirmation right after they're done? Okay, it's great. Something moving on and keep having that next thing. And even if it means, oh, we don't have 40 kids, that's, that's fine. Do I have some? 
I have 10, that's okay. I can work with 10 and make them the 10 most excited there. They love this church, 10 kids in the world, right? That they want to come to because I promise you, if they love it in time, 10 will tell their friends, 10 will become 15, and then 15 becomes quickly 30. And before you know it, now you're on another level and you're moving to 30, 30 becomes 60. It just happens a lot more quickly. It's that first push to keep us. So to your point, yes, John, the, um, the momentum, I think, is key to, uh, but there really has to be um, continued, if you will, pushing them, to your point, um, uh, sharing some greater opportunities, greater things. Let's vision out, let's see what else is out there. And then after it's done, like I did with Kevin, see how, look what you did. What else can we do? How awesome is that? You, you, you killed it. That's awesome. I think we can do more. And, you, and then if you try it in that, one of the things that our call that we did was at the time, at one of the, uh, uh, it was a few years ago, I think we were only working about 220 at that time. And um, Patterson, uh, we wanted to do some things at the local church, at local schools. And so we said, we do backpacks. And he said, we don't want to just do backpacks. We want to fill those backpacks. And we've got one of the schools. And he said, uh, the idea was maybe we can do, like, you know, each one gets a backpack and fills it for them. When we asked this Patterson school uh, how many students they had, he said, oh, we probably need a thousand. And I was like, oh, and then we found out that each bag will cost about five dollars um, to do, print, engrave on bulk, and and then with all the pieces, the the the, the paper, the pens, the rulers, the, but all the stuff, each bag ended up being about eleven bucks. Okay, that's, that's a lot of money when you consider you have you need a lot of. Them. So I said, mm. And mind you, our young adult group was not just older mm. folks who have jobs; these are a lot of college students. But I put it on them, right? I said, yeah, each of you guys, I know how much you spend on Starbucks coffee. Um, you know, you guys, that's two bags. That's, that's, that's half a bag right there. You guys can do it. Um, so, but I challenge them, if each of you guys can do three bags, it's $33, right? Then we can have about six to 700. That's pretty good. And we started to see them doing it. And then they did those three bags. And then we showed a picture, we put it on Facebook, with people like it, da da da. And the pride of that, and like, you know what? I'm gonna do more. They started buying more. We had, and just like, we're kind of reaching at the time, about 220, half of them are college students. We were able to make over a thousand backpacks for that school and then give the leftovers to another school nearby. Hmm. And it was, and then I said, and we took a picture, I should have brought the pictures, of a thousand backpacks, not of a thousand member church. This is, you know, this is you know, a relatively smaller sized church, if you will. And, and, and I said, look, well, and not just give it. I said, now on this day, I want you to come and I want you to hand this out. And so for those that couldn't come, we took a nice video, excellent video presentation, so we can do it, post it, they can share it, and that became, right, it went all around. Now you see all the friends are saying, that is work, that's my church. And then next Sunday, they're like, mm, that's my church. It's all these, and, and so, and then right after that, what are they saying? They're saying, now what? Now what's next? Now what's next? Yeah, now what's next? We can do a lot. What, what can we do now? Now, now they're really excited. And they're frustrated that I'm not moving past them. Right? Yeah. Okay, and that's a good problem. So when can you start? Yeah. <laughs> Talk to Bishop. <laughs> no, no, no. say that this, um, I think the fact that you all are here tonight is a huge, huge plus. The fact that I'm here, you're pretty much required, means that you all are in some general sense of choral euphony, right, around this idea. Perhaps maybe one of the challenges that you will have is how to sell it, if you will, to the larger church. That may be task that you have before you that may be larger than, um, who knows, um, but that's the challenge that we face. But that being said, um, I promise you when the young people are really coming and are really participating, they who really don't, may not see it, in time, in time, will buy in, into it.
want to ask you something else. They said, in this church, uh, we've tried several times over the years to have a youth minister. They've been very, very hard to find. Mm -hmm. Just not many who want to do that. And so it sort of turns out to have been a first-time pastor who shows up here, who comes here as, as an associate, who's assigned the duties of youth ministry, and I'm not sure they all had that as a primary interest. But in any event, they're very hard to come by, as I, as I mentioned. And they're very hard to keep them because they're young. Know. So given that, what would you look for in a youth leader? Um, I will answer that in a second. And I'll say, before that, I would probably say, not only the youth leader, but with the church that's hiring the youth leader, I would say what the church would probably need is a large measure of flexibility and grace. Because a youth a youth leader, especially for getting them in their infancy, if you will, of a ministerial infancy, they're wet behind the ears. They're certainly gonna make a lot of mistakes. They're gonna say things that you that really will jive. Scott, you may kind of like run it. There's gonna be a lot of those moments. Um, um, and even for me, I can say, um, that's first years, I think I was, I didn't really know what I was doing. But what I did have was I had the backing of a senior pastor, I had the backing of some key people. So they defended me when some parents were like, Mom, why would he? Uh, yeah, there was one particular retreat we took them and it was a snow blizzard and they were up in arms because they wanted to save the kids. No, and we still did it. So our church, if you leadership, defended me. Matt is going to take care of that. We'll make sure that we will scout what he needs. Um, and they got, they took the brunt of the hit and protected me from, from all of that. So that, I think, needs to happen. Because this youth leader that you're going to get is going to be wet in the ears. It's going to be there. If you're going to get them, you're going to, they're going to probably be um, younger, um, probably seminary, um, or right out of seminary. Um, because a really great, experienced, it's, it's, it's kind of like a church I was at who's looking for a lead pastor. They're looking for someone who is in their early 30s, who's married with two kids, but has the time like a single person, um, uh, right? who's, who's, full, who's, who's working full time, but only gets paid part time. You know, that they wanted the, 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 the super person. It doesn't exist. Um, uh, or if they exist, because they actually some of them do exist, they probably are in really nice settings already. So why would they leave a really good position um, for um, something that's really kind of starting up? Um, so um, I would say uh, the expectations have to be at a bit lower, knowing that you're going to help farm them and grow them. But like I said, I was in that church for 11 years. Could you have dealt with me for 11 years knowing how I, you know, but if you stay with someone for 11 years, I promise you, and with the kind of love and encouragement and support, they become quite, quite, quite powerful in that particular church. So part of it is sticking through the, the difficulty, you know, difficult times. But um, things that I will look for, I will look for, it's more me personal, but I look for passion, mature passion, energy, because kids, they want to, they, they react to that. I met one young adult pastor who will be nameless, and that guy, he's young, he's only 28, oh, but oh my gosh, he's like, I really believe in the ministry. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> 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 that's, really far. that's a hard sell, right? Um, so, so passionate, but um, teachable, that's a huge one. Um, I would say hungry, uh, not satisfied. And yet humble. Um, so, so those are four real key qualities. Because mm -hmm. the rest, you know, the piece like preaching, yeah, you can always, you know, you can adjust with preaching and learning. And, 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 yeah. I got a question. Yeah. Why, um, why is everybody trying to separate things? I grew up, my father went in the army, or went in the military, I went in the military. He didn't hunt, I didn't hunt. I followed my father. So why do we need a minister? And I don't mean you guys. I mean, I'm going to get home to Texas eventually. But I guess, 
if the adults lead, the kids are going to follow. Mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't understand why it's that big of a deal. Yeah, I think in, in in many cases where you you know you and certainly me, I was blessed to have a dad who was extremely hands on with me yeah. and loving. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the families and I don't know, especially for something about New Jersey, northern New Jersey, near New York. I don't know. There's something about this. Not to show the way or anything. There's something about Jersey. Um, where um, I feel like um, the, the parent's voice is huge. And if you're blessed with really great parents that can really understand the nuances of that, I think that really can help, obviously. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of the ones at least that have come into our church when I was at Arpolo didn't have that. And so they were looking for some other voice. And when they were getting it from their parents, they certainly were getting it from their parents, and they're not getting it from the church, they're going to get it somewhere else. And um, a lot of them did find themselves. I, you know, I officiated one of my young people who committed suicide um, uh, three years ago um, because he was he was dealing with homosexuality. He was then rejected by his father. Um, he lived a lifestyle. He tried it out, and then um, he would eventually hang himself. Um, I, and I counseled him for years through that time. Um, for those that are blessed to have some great parents, I think you know, that's a real blessing. That there's something about New Jersey. I don't. I don't really know what it is. I, I know a lot of my friend who's from Virginia. He came up to Jersey for two years and then moved back to Virginia. He called New Jersey his wilderness period. Uh, he was like, I don't know what's going on here, but it's, not, it's hard. It's hard. Um, um, but, but as somebody who's worked, spent his whole adult life working with, with, with young adults, at that age, as much as they love their parents. Mm -hmm. They're challenging their parents, and they have their own views and their own thoughts about things, and they want to express those, and it's not always what mom and dad want to hear, you know, but if they have parents that love them and at least will support that they want to have that opinion, then that goes a long way. Yeah. And give them the freedom, right, absolutely, to, give, yeah. to have their own opinion. Yeah. Those are some of the kind of high-level yeah. um, parents, um, not all of them like that. No, no, no. Not that us. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. They may not listen to them, they may not challenge them, they're going to follow their example. Mm -hmm. And if mom and dad have made it a priority to go to church and to live a Christian life, the kids will follow. Yeah. The problem is in northern Jersey, that, that most people don't do that. Mm -hmm. They don't make it a priority. Mm -hmm. They get to church when they have the day free. Amen. You know, it's true. Mm -hmm. when they... When it's convenient. When it's convenient, <coughs> yes. Between the soccer practices and, and if the football, the parents right. do that, then why would the kids do any differently? And that's that's so why. That's another culture. challenge. That's our culture. That means our culture. Well, the kids would if we were that great and that fun and enthusiastic, and we allowed them to make their own decision and things like that. So we want the youth, but we don't have them on any committees. They're not involved. They're not the decision makers. We want to control them. Let them do what they, that's what I think Matt is talking about. They want voice. They're not going to come into something that's already prescribed for them. They want to know, maybe they want confirmation class. I'm making this up, no offense. Maybe they want it on Friday night at 9 o'clock. You know, yes. 9 as well. Maybe that's when they want I'm just saying. And, and, but and we will say, 9 o'clock, that's too late. Or maybe they want, you know, to hang out and camp in the church. I don't know what they want. They want a lot of things. And I think that it's important is saying that we want this, but I say, do we really, really, really want this? You know what I mean? I don't know what we really want. Do we want them on the committee saying we want this? Mm -hmm. You know, let's get the bus instead of carpet on the floor. I'm making that up. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We don't even have a bus. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, uh, so, I mean, we need, you know, that's a great idea. We need a bus. We need a bus to get places. We need to combine. So, I think uh, that's important. I think it's good what you said. The 28-year-old that was like, no expression. You know, I, I don't think age is necessarily the answer. I think you got to be careful with that. Because there's a lot of young folks I know that, you know, I had a lot more energy than them. But I'm not saying that because I'm a little more mature. I'm just 29, but anyway. <laughs> but I'm just Amen. saying, you can't. <laughs> but people always think that that's the thing. They got to be this, they got to be this. You know, God is so not in that box. Mm -hmm. 
and we have to think outside the box. And they have to have the passion. They don't just don't have the age. Have the passion for young folks. Have the passion to run with them, to hear them, to not be in your own little thing. Have the passion to be able to listen to them, you know, when they have these struggles with homosexuality and all this. Have the openness. You know, it's just like, I don't know, I'm just like, oh, I'm sitting here going like, oh. Like, yeah. You know. yeah, to John, and as you were saying to John, your point, one of the things I would also probably add to that before is the passion of that. Um, you have to really love. You, you think that's kind of just, you know, it's done, you have to really love the kids. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Um, and that's got to be, that's right. that's gotta be genuine. It's got to be honest. Yeah. For kids, look, they know. They know. They know. They know. Mm -hmm. So for me, I, I'll, I'll say that when I was building that, that core group of that loyalty, if you will, I went to, and it's for that, I think, my own experience, because my dad was a full-time pastor, so he never came to any of my sports activities. That was something I had to work through. I'm still working out. But as a young person, um, so on the basketball team, he never came to one game. He never came to any of my track meets. Um, and it was because uh, he was always meeting, doing ministry, someone had cancer, you know, he was, and I could never argue with God. How could I argue? And it was, it was always more important. So that was my own issues, but I, what I said when I went to ministry, and maybe I was kind of following this way, but I said, I want them to know that. I, I, I love them and I really want to be there for them. So every sporting event, I was there. Ridgewood, I don't know how many times I've been to Ridgewood gymnasium for volleyball and for basketball games. When, and then whatever it was, whether it was the sporting events, the graduations, I, when the senior classes are bad, it's like, oh my gosh, how am I gonna do all their graduations? But I try to make it to all their graduations even if other people could not. Um, and then what was so great was in those moments, they called me. When, I remember this guy Joe, he called me, he didn't tell his parents, when he actually was arrested, and then he had to have an arraignment, he was a kid. And, uh, and then he called me, that, unfortunately, that guy David who hung himself, I would be the first person that he came out to, before his sister, before his parents, before his best friends. And all that I'm not saying is because I'm great, it's because I spent, because I went to their graduations, right? I spent, and not just because I had to, I really wanted to be with them, right? That overcame a lot of my mistakes. And then the kids will defend that, and they'll go to their parents and say, I like that person, do not change that person, keep that person, right? I mean, that's from ministry one. You know, I, I don't know that I really agree you know, with what you said. I mean, I like to think that I'm a pretty regular here at church. My son has no interest in coming to church. There's nothing here for him. It's what Matt is talking about. I mean, there's nothing to make him want to come. It's the same service that it was when he was 13 years old. They're interested in men. It's not interested in him. That's the problem. He's interested in men, so he thinks he's still not yeah. interested in him. Right? Yeah. So, if I told you guys who I am or where I've been, you wouldn't believe it. But I can say this. I'm 36 years old, I'm here right now, and I brought a Bluetooth speaker, and you guys need it. So, there's something on my head, and I'm just going to say it. But, and it's funny that you are who you are, because I'm the exact opposite. You know, blue collar, army guy, uh, all of that. Here's what it comes down to. The truth, I don't care what it is, is going to stand on its own two feet. Mm -hmm. The wheel didn't need promotion. It didn't need marketing. It's still here because it's the truth. That's it. These kids aren't coming because there's no truth. Bottom line, whether you want to hear it or not, that's the fact. They do know everything because they have Google. They don't need you. Whether you like it or not, that's the truth. Five days of my life, I read, I cried, and I Googled the Bible. That was it. If you want kids, if you want people to follow you, they're sick and tired of the politicians. They're sick and tired of the government. They're sick and tired of everybody having their hand out and nobody telling the truth. And it's just what you do. No. I promise you he's not coming back for a building. He's coming back for his people. And his people are all on the street freezing their ass off right now. Excuse my French. Well, that's where they are. They're hungry, they're sick, they're tired, and they got nothing. That's what he's coming back for. So, if you want people, if you want his people, this is not your church. It's his. 
End of story. It's not an option. It's his church. We're here to follow him. Not the man, his work. What was his work? He was in the temple, what, five times? One time he walked in, called them all hypocrites and tore it down. He was in the street helping his people. That's why you don't have kids. Seattle, Washington, they're blowing up churches all over the place. They're, every time you turn around, you're playing in another church. There's youth that's coming out in crazy numbers. Why? Because people are standing in front of the youth telling them the truth. This is why you don't have sex before you get married. This is why you have it while you get married. This is what you do here. This is what you do there. Bergen County's got more money than I know what to do with. And there's people on the street in Bergen County. That's a problem. Yeah. Jimmy, I appreciate that sharing. And, and the thing is, the gift that this church and any of the other churches have is that it becomes a mouthpiece for that to happen, for that to be discussed, for that to be shared. The one thing that I can say is that the gift of this space and the gift of the people, and the gift of any church is that we are all broken, we are all in need. Absolutely. We're all completely wrecked and impoverished and poor in our own limited ways. But the gift is that we have an opportunity, right? This is an amazing, beautiful thing for whoever God brings our way. I wanted to ask you about services. You talked before about the services that you had. Was it was it was it the normal Sunday morning, or was it do you find other times better for young people? Or? Right, right. For us, we had two. We actually had three. Um, we had a Wednesday night <coughs> prayer meeting. Wednesday night prayer prayer meeting. Um, so that was anyone who would like to come. It was from um, eight to nine. Anyone who wanted to come and just for prayer. So I had a little Ben McDard and a little message and, and prayer. Very intimate because it was a weeknight. Um, so a lot of kids didn't come. But if their parents came, they tacked along if they came. We had, it was a very intimate, uh, personal time. So a lot of people share and confess a lot of their own stuff. Because no one's there, right? Friday night was a big, fun kind of thing. It was, um, we would start with um, uh, music, a praise, worship, and then a message and then fellowship, food, and games. And so that began at around 7 o'clock, and they would go till, some of them stayed till 11 midnight. Even. What's a fellowship? Uh, fellowship like um, like games, oh. just kind of hanging out. Um, um, the weather's really nice. Um, we'd go outside, you know, do different things. Um, um, so that was, Friday, that was every Friday night. So regardless of what happened, that was gonna happen Friday night. And then Sunday services were happening simultaneously with the adult services. So when the adults' parents come, the kids had their own place um, to go. And it was a full blown service. Um, that was a teaching moment for them, too, to start to see what liturgy meant, why that was important, right? Um, so for them to be offering and to understand why that was important. Um, on communion. Um, so all that was happening about addiction. What does benediction mean? Uh, right? um, what does that even mean? A good word? And using that kind of mm -hmm. to share. So all those things were happening for them in that space. And then the both went the close at the same time, and then we all yeah, fellowship. A lot of them, they just enjoyed being there. So they stayed <coughs> long past the parents leaving. It's a Sunday from morning till probably about six, seven o'clock. And then we go to the park and they play basketball, football till the till okay. Okay. But um, that's what I mean by they, they just, it's not a church for them anymore yeah. in the formal sense. It's where I just want to go. So when there's a blackout for the adults, when there was a blackout here in Bourbon County, where did they come? Church. It was fun. Everyone's going to be there. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be fun. I don't know. Why. I'm not going to my TV doesn't. My internet doesn't work. Um, but all I know is it's going to be great. Yeah. That's the kind of atmosphere. Okay. Yeah. 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 I know you're talking about um, your high schoolers and your college age kids that were um, kids in mm -hmm. your church. That's one demographic that you tend to miss in this area because it's so expensive to live here mm -hmm. that a lot of kids, when they leave home, they don't come back to this area. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a big hole that I feel like that we have people who 
they might be raised in a certain way and they want to go out there and help, and then they're just kind of gone and they're out there on their own. And do you have any thoughts on, and I know you're in Kratnas. You, yeah, the church is so in So you've got much more concentrated population in Kratnas, River Edge, I think back mm -hmm. that area. But, but uh, I'll say- thoughts for our missing hole, because that's big here. Yeah, I'll say this, um, if it's, and this sounds like a throwaway line, but if it's good, they'll come. We had people from Staten Island that were coming here. Um, we had people that traveled two hours to get to our church. And I was like, there's got to be a church closer to where you are. Like, uh, yeah, but there, we wanted to come be here, right? So um, that being said, I, I know that uh, this is located in Wyckoff, but when I think of Grace University in Wyckoff, I think, not a lot of thinking, you guys, it can, it can go all the way down to Hackensack, no, no question. I think we were pulling people easily from Fort Lee and many people commuting from New York that would take public transportation in. Um, if it's a place they want to be, I promise you will travel. It seemed like about an hour was their, was their max. Uh, we had kids from Rutgers kind of coming up as well. And to that point as well, when they graduated college, I know a lot of folks will kind of move elsewhere. And we did lose people. But if it's a strong enough place, I have people saying, we want to come back because of the church. Um, because this became, it became part of their home. Um, so they want to be part of it. So that actually played a big role in a lot of people coming back to live here. Um, um, it, could, it could be that powerful to draw. Um, but um, but I, I will say, though, that yes, um, I think Grace UMC, if it's if it has something that's really that powerful, it can actually draw from an hour's away, one hour. Well, we already do draw from a pretty good area for mm -hmm. adults. Right. What I'm the sense that I'm getting is that I mean we have a fellowship group that we went to tonight. A small fellowship group, high school age kids, and some middle school kids, but. I think it has to be more than fellowship. It's got to be the message. And then there's got to be some meat there, is what you were saying. Mm -hmm. There's got to be a really good, and it's got to be relevant to their lives mm -hmm. and speak to where they're at. Yes. Like Jesus spoke to people yeah. where they're at. Yeah. And Amen. And not up here mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the service is, is a great idea because the fellowship we've been. It's been very static. And even when we had youth pastors, mm -hmm. um, our fellowship gatherings were sometimes two kids, mine, mm -hmm. <laughs> with first Liana. And she was great, but it, it uh, you got to go all the way back to Jim Campbell. Yeah. Well, I wasn't yeah. doing that. And Jim Campbell <laughs> yeah. had right. five heard, kids in the I heard lunch. good, great stories. Yeah. I mean, his, 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 it just grew overnight with him. Yeah. So what happened? But, but because he had those characteristics that Matthew described. Yeah. Yeah. He had that passion, he had that honesty with the kids. It yeah. yeah. mattered to him. Where do, where do our children come? You know, we're talking about youth, which I, I, when I say youth, I'm thinking teenagers. We have a growing population in this church, and my kids are, are some of that population, but when you see even our new families coming in, they're bringing children, you know, mm -hmm. under, under nine years old. They are the future youth of this church. They are the future young adults of this church. And I don't know where they, I mean, they're children's ministry, so it's different than youth, but they are going to become the youth. If we don't groom them properly to want to become the youth, our biggest feeding cell is our children that are already here. <coughs> A lot of parents are drawn here, I think. And I, I, I took, I, I don't know if you saw this weekend, we had a baby that was baptized here. And when... Before that, we had our little children's time. I saw people whispering when they saw all the children in our congregation get up and stand up there, you know, to get Scott's word. I could see them saying, wow, we picked a good church. Like, I could see, like, amongst them saying, wow, this is a great church to raise a, a child in, because they see all the children. So in some ways, as if I chose this church, before I had children, because I wanted to raise my children in a church that would welcome children. Mm -hmm. So our biggest feeding cell is actually the families who don't even have children yet, mm -hmm. who are thinking about it, that those children become the youth we already have captured. We have them here, 
let's not lose them, let's keep them here. And we have that. When you, how do you, and I guess, does that factor in? Because you want to draw you from outside, but we have a feeding cell right within our own confines. Can we, how do you cultivate that? How do you factor that in? Is that, I guess, it has to be factored in. Absolutely. It, it, it is the reason children, it, it's funny because now because now we don't have a church any longer, right? Because now I'm part of the conference staff, so I'm kind of floating. I feel bad for my kids because we're kind of floating around a bit and visiting from places. But we visit churches. And I'll tell you, I can tell you right from the get-go, what churches, now that I'm on the up, opposite side of the pulpit, as a, as a lay person, if you will, kind of visiting churches, I'm like, oh, this I would never bring my family to. I'm just being yeah. honest. Yeah. Yeah. This would not work out. And there are churches around this area, and that there are some, because they have a young children's ministry, I'd say. Hmm. And you see a lot of like, people that left the church when they were college young adults, they got married, a kid, are going to come back to church for the same exact reason because they because of their kids, right? Now, so that's a huge kind of uh, draw. But then, like with the the like as John was talking about, how do you kind of keep that momentum moving? Same thing goes. You have to have a strong children's ministry, elementary ministry, middle school, then you and you have to keep that moving in such a way where there's constant kind of momentum. They want to stick around because at some point those those kids will age out, or not, but they'll wake up and say, you know what, I don't want to go, and you can't make them, um, that, if that day is going to happen, um, and even if you are the most faithful attender of that church, um, some kids, kids will follow that, and other kids may resent that, um, so um, that's, uh, that's something that is a tension that is unique to each family, but you... It, there is places along every step of that process, by all means. I would say my recommendation would be start with where you're at. So if you have some children, then grow that to be the best children's ministry. So even with regard to when I did an Arcola, they didn't start saying, Matt, come in and start an English ministry. That's not what they said. They said, start where you are. If this is growing, then we'll keep kind of feeding that. And then over time, it kind of became that. So I would say start where you are. I think um, Scott was sharing with me that there were some young families that recently came to the church. Um, I said, that's awesome. Young families, it's so hard to find that are going to come back. Start with them. Do something different. I, not to say, don't pull them back into the larger church yet. Maybe use them as a catalyst to start something even new. Right? So, they, they, so that's a new voice away from the kind of the old ways of doing things that may even prime the pump for something completely different. But I would say definitely start, or with the confirmation of students here 12, then I would start with those 12, and not just try to get people that you don't have. I would just start kind of working on make it the best possible you could. They will come after that. Yeah. Another thing to think about, or maybe you can um, add to, or the kids who are confirmation age and older, mm -hmm. um, is what outreach programs did you use with your kids, not really adults with the church, because so many times the kids want to help and they want to go out and actually help underprivileged people or poor people or they want to feed someone and they need the actual connection mm -hmm. with those individuals, not just like I brought a can of safety church and stuck it in a bag right. and it went to somebody who needed it. They need to see the person who needs it. They need to have that personal connection so that they can, you know, feel it, so they can feel the love that they're giving and maybe receive mm -hmm. love back. And they're always told, like, you know, well, you're not old enough to go on that, or insurance doesn't allow it, or, like, they finish confirmation at eighth grade, but they're not allowed to go on the summer um, mission. mission trip until they finish ninth grade. Well, after a year, they're bored, they're done. Like, they need, yes. there needs to be something, like, in the summer that they do. As soon as they're done with eighth grade, like, oh, you're an adult now, but you're not old enough to go and help people. Yes. You know, that, that's really a... You can't go feed the family packets that family promise. Yeah, you're too young for that. But that's really a great and point. And so much sure these kids are, well, not all, but lots of kids are <laughs> way so beyond. I mean, when I was 13 years old, I was nowhere near where my kids are at 13. I mean, I would have no idea what I'm doing. But my, my daughter has a strong faith in God today because she went to the homeless shelter, and she fed people, and she went to Rise, and she came home and told me about Daddy. We helped this person, you know, we built a ramp for them so they could get down and get in there. I mean, it meant so much to her, and that's why I think she has a strong faith today. Right. 
I, I think, yes, yes, yes. So um, great, but and I am a huge mission and outreach is, is 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 not like it's not like Jesus way. It's, it's really the way to our that we're connected uh, to Christ. In all my years, until we had our twins, uh, since sixth grade, I was on a mission trip, South Carolina, Paraguay, um, for three years. Um, Malawi, four years. We built four water wells. China, six years. Um, we did uh, 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 North Carolina. We, in other words, so everything from domestic to international to halfway around the world to local, Patterson, New York, the Bowery Mission. I did almost every Saturday um, with the men's ministry down there. In other words, there are millions of opportunities, right? We're Certainly, the millions of opportunities. That being said, I think to your point, how what are some of those opportunities with regards to age-sensitive uh, children, right? Um, in that way, uh, I remember one that I took maybe our junior high folks to. Um, we went. There's a couple places you could do it domestically. So we go down to Hinton, South Carolina, where we participated in a larger kind of outreach with. A more established missions piece that kind of we built homes in some impoverished areas, but we took the whole like the church. It was a uh, delegation of a lot of people, so it was yes, it was junior high kids, but it was also with senior high kids and a lot of leaders, right, that were there. In another case, it was families, so it was an option for a family to go, and we had a group of families, maybe four families, that went together for three or four days together. And that was a great time of bonding for the families, but also for the younger kids. Who legally really can't do that, but when they were family able to participate. Another for, for those that were in junior high, uh, we they went to the Dominican Republic, and again with a lot of um, a guardianship. Um, and if the parents didn't feel comfortable, one of the parents went on that trip with them. But they would go to the Dominican Republic, and they would spend a week doing hands-on um, ministry uh, with the people there. And when you take them out of this Jersey context. It just opens seriously, truthfully, their eyes of faith um, to what's really the world. Um, maybe to, to Jimmy's point, as he was saying earlier, really opens up their their minds and their hearts. So as often as possible, getting them out, even if it means, frankly, to home. I, I have one yeah. family that brought their kid who was in the fifth grade um, to the our mission trip. They did it as a family um, to the men's ministry down in in, uh, in Bowery, which is near Chinatown. And it was, like you said, it was the kid like, loved it. And the things, the people in that in that ministry loved seeing the kids mm -hmm. um, there. It was vice versa, right? Um, um, and there's a million other options out there. But I will say, it's not local to just can goods. You can absolutely take them around and everywhere. But you know, we'll have to do things that are ultimately comfortable and legal um, and safe for. Just like you say, uh, I bought a house in Texas and I stayed down there for 10 years when I was in the Army. And when I came back home, well, upstate New York's not home. And when I came back to Jersey, you know what I hear all the time from everybody? And I haven't been in the church in 10 years. You probably won't ever go back. But what I hear from everybody in New Jersey is this. Well, it is what it is. It blows my mind. Because they all want to claim something. I don't get it. Because he said three things we need to know. There's one God. Jesus' work is the way into heaven. And everything's possible. 
So New Jersey is the way New Jersey is because New Jersey wants to be this way. End of story. <laughs> if you want to hear it, hear it. He said, for those who have ears, let them hear. But you have people in this room who want to make a difference. Then by all means. Yeah. Legal what? The cops are going to stop me from feeding somebody? I just did it the other day in Fairlawn. What are they going to do? Tell me, no, I can't give out hats to homeless people? You kidding me? Let's put that on the news. The police department arrests a uh, disabled war vet for handing out hats in Fairlawn. Come on. They did arrest an elderly man, 90-something, in of course California they for feeding, but they let him out because something's already different. Listen, so that's when you have to use your own the, Jesus sense. The kids and, and, and the Not people of this world are sick and tired of the lies. And if you want to change the game, you got to change the way they do things. And I promise you, everything you said tonight makes perfect sense. Because people are sick and tired of doing the same thing over and over and over again. Okay, I was raised Roman Catholic. I was confirmed at 18. I became a man Valentine's Day of this year. I'm 36 years old. I finally became a man. And I have no problem saying it. Second Timothy's, uh, study should show thyself approved. The workman need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. See, I don't need it for anybody else. Because I know what it is. That's it. We don't need to build big programs and all the rest of this. Put your boots on your feet and get up and go help some people. And that's it. That's all it is. I think we're all basically saying a lot of the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just different voices and different experiences. And different lenses. And um, uh, that's a good uh, patch. Um, I think there's a lot of good work here that's been done. And this is now an invitation to a new season uh, for this church. Um, and I'm glad that you all are here to help usher it in. Because you become the voices for the young folks that may right now not have that right yet. But because of you, we can. Um, so I pray that everything that is absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, it is indeed the beginning of the new season, and, and I appreciate all of you coming out tonight, and uh, especially what God has put on your heart to share with us, Matthew. And, uh, you know, uh, so many people say, you know, that the youth are the future of our church, but as I heard some up here say, you know, they are the church. I'm having the privilege of meeting with each of the confirmants individually as we talk and, and discuss. And one of the last things I say to them is, you know, you realize once you're confirmed, you are a full member of this church, just like your parents, just like any other adult. You, you know, you should be on the committees, you should Make decisions. You gotta let people see you, and and you know, and there's something like, what do you mean? You know, like, you know we're sequestered to the whole wall down here. You know, we don't. They don't want to see us. You know, but um, we're absolutely right. You know, we, we need to provide opportunities for uh, the young people to be in leadership because you know they're going to be picking our retirement homes. So you know, we want to make sure. <laughs> And, um, but just to, to to let them know that you know this is part of, of their ministry as well. And, uh, and so, again, thanks for coming out tonight. And as part of our ongoing visioning process, as we're reinventing you know, who we are, uh, this is certainly one, one of the more important aspects uh, of the ministry of the church. And, um, and so may God bless our endeavors as we move forward from here. And may God keep traveling mercies and you uh, head on back home this evening. All right. Thank you, everybody. Uh, feel free to hang up the chairs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and my friend Jimmy, thanks for coming in and visiting with us tonight. We'll see you all soon.